I want to talk to you about dying. We don't want to deal with death because most Christians don't like death. When was the last time you woke up in the morning going, you know what, I'm one day closer to getting to heaven. You don't have to be scared of death. It doesn't matter what you do to me. I have victory in Jesus. When was the last time you were a witness of eternity? The fear should be the fear of the Lord, not the fear of death. I want to talk to you about something that we don't talk about. No, it's not sex. It's something you really, like, I don't remember the last time somebody sat down with me and said, hey, let's talk about this. It's a topic which everyone's going to have to deal with. It's a topic which we're all going to experience. But here's the craziest thing. It, we, nobody talks about it. And the craziest thing is, majority of Christians, if you look at them and talk to them about it, they have such a negative view of it. Remember I said to you before you sat down, turn to the person beside you and said, I'm dying to hear the sermon? I want to talk to you about dying. I want to talk to you about death. Now, how do you walk up to somebody and say, hey, let's talk about death? I mean, you can talk about baseball, you can talk about Christmas, you can talk about desserts, but how many of us we've ever got excited about death? I mean, when was the last time you could sit down with somebody and go, I'm looking forward to heaven? And yet, if you read the Bible and you read about death and you read about eternity, well, let me give you an illustration. A few years ago, Shelley took the boys and I on a holiday, and it was so exciting that three weeks before we went on the holiday, I was driving the staff nuts saying, I'm only 20 days away, 19 days away. I can't wait to get there or when we get there. And I was talking all about holidays. When was the last time you woke up in the morning going, you know what, I'm one day closer to getting to heaven? For most of us, we're working way too hard to try to stay away from heaven. And then when somebody does go to heaven, when they're a believer, we're like, oh, here's the craziest thing. Mark Twain said it this way, let us endeavor so to live that when we come to die, even the undertakers will be sorry. But here's the Apostle Paul. He had the attitude that, and, and let me just share this with you. Sometimes my attitude stinks towards death but Paul had the greatest attitude, Philippians 1, 21. He said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. When was the last time you sat down and you started to realize for you to die, that's my, my, isn't, oh. I have met and I have dealt with so many people who are terminally ill. I have sat in the room when people have passed away so many times. What an honor it's been. These Christians who have a Christ view of eternity instead of a worldly view of eternity, they die phenomenal. I have been in the room with terminally ill people who have smiled and said, Pastor, why are you crying? In a couple hours, I'm going to be sitting in the lap of Father God. I'm, you know, Pastor, I feel sorry for you because you're still stuck here. And then a couple hours later, they leave and they have a smile on their face. I mean, when was the last time you sat down with your loved ones and you just talked about death? Well, I hear Christians say, I'm scared. I'm terrified. I, I love what 1 Corinthians says in verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 55. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. Jesus gives us victory. How, God gives us victory, how? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
In other words, death, come on. It doesn't matter what you do to me. I have victory in Jesus. Death, there is no sting. The victory is in Christ our Lord. You know what? The sickness, there is no sting. Guess what? When the race is ended, I'm going to be in winner's row. I'm going to have streets of gold. I'm going to be with Jesus Christ. So there's four things I talked to you about. Number one, fear. Lots of people have fear of death. They're born-again Christians. I've had them in my office. Just so you know, I've had fear of death. When John Kennedy, J.F. Kennedy, President of the United States, was assassinated, I was at home watching cartoons, and all of a sudden, my mother, who let me watch anything on TV, which was crazy, I got to see them showing John F. Kennedy assassinated. I became fear. And my older brothers would come up to me and say, oh, when you're in bed tonight, the boogeyman's going to get you. Mankind's going to get you. Oh, the ghost of death will get you. And here I'm six years old. And mom didn't believe in nightlights. Why waste electricity? Learn to live in the dark. So I'd be in my bed, and my brothers would come in. And I'd be, ah! Six years old, terrified of death. Come on. Don't tell me you've never been like that. And my dad sat me down. And he sat me on his lap. And he said to me, sweetie, you're not alone when you're in bed. Mommy and daddy aren't there. And thank God your brothers aren't. But Jesus is there. You don't have to be scared of death. Psalms 23 says it beautifully. Psalms 23, verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Thou preparest a table before my present of enemies. Thou anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will because of Christ in me, dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You can, you can give me the worst disease. You can torture me until I die. But you can't rob me of eternal life with Christ. The fear should be the fear of the Lord, not the fear of death. Here's the truth. The Bible teaches me that to be living is great, but to be absent from this body, I'm with the Lord. Jesus says to the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise. It's not two weeks from now or when the rapture takes place. As soon as you die, okay, you don't go into limbo or purgatory, or any other goofy place, if you have Christ in your life, you go and you are with the Lord. So there is, for a Christian, you need to wrestle through this fear of death. The other part of fear is fear of leaving family. My family's not ready for me to leave. Uh, they're not serving the Lord, or I need to get things in order, and we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. The other one is the fear of the unknown, where, where believers will say, you know, I, I've never experienced death, and when you don't experience something, you have a little bit of nervousness. I, there's a difference between nervousness and fear. Revelations 21 says that the streets of the city, which are heaven, will be pure gold. The Bible talks about heaven where there will be no more tears or sorrow. He will wipe them away, which means if there's no tear or sorrow in heaven, what's in heaven? Joy. The Bible says that we will rule and reign with him for eternity. Now, for some of you who think when you get to heaven, you get a lazy boy chair and you eat the rest of your life and you do nothing. Think about how boring that would be. The Bible says we'll rule and reign with him for eternity. Now, this is not biblical. 
listen to me carefully, it's not biblical. But I somehow think, why would he create a universe if he wasn't going to use a universe? That's why I love Star Trek. See, when we get to heaven, we will boldly go where no man has gone before. When we get to heaven, we're going to have glorified bodies. We're not going to get stuck with this thing, although I know I'm good. <laughs> There's not going to be a weight problem. We're not going to lose hair. We're not going to gain hair. Here's one for you. There's no politicians and no taxes. Now, yes, politicians can come to know Christ, but trust me, they're not running for office. Here's the craziest thing. We need to know that the Bible does talk about the unknown. When was the last time you sat down and talked about it? Number two, preparing. I broke it into two areas, supernaturally. Now, for some of you who've been Christians a long time, you need to listen to me. Jesus said, if you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. You ever notice that sometimes we get so comfortable we don't realize that we're losing out on being hot for Christ? The Bible says that people will come up to him and they'll go, Lord, Lord, I cast out demons in your name. I healed the sick. And Jesus will say on judgment day, I'm sorry, I never knew you. It's not you never knew me. I never knew you. Why? Because you were lukewarm and you weren't hot. Which means Jesus wasn't Lord of everything. Yesterday we moved this piece of furniture that had been in our house for over 10 years. We've never moved it. And when I moved it, I couldn't believe the dust. Now, although you couldn't see the dust, and the house looked like it was dustless, when we moved the furniture, we found... When was the last time you started moving things around in your life so you could see if there's dust that Jesus needs to get rid of? Dust equals, could be sin or things that are stopping you from serving God. See, supernaturally is this. It's not just confessing your sins, but it's making him Lord, preparing for heaven. The other part is not only supernaturally, but naturally. I have a will. I have a power of attorney. Power of attorney means that if I get sick, somebody will t take over my, my finances and, my, and take care of me. There's living wills, which, so if I get sick, Shelly knows, and my power attorney is Shelly, knows she's not allowed to resuscitate me. Christians, you know this, this whole thing about superstitions? Christians are superstitious. I've met Christians who say, I can't do a prearranged funeral, because as soon as I do, I know God will take me home. <laughs> God couldn't care less about waiting for you to do the prearranged funeral. But can I ask you something? Wouldn't it be nice to prepare for heaven so that your family doesn't have to do a lot of work when you're gone? The other day, a young man, 32 years of age, killed on the 401. This whole fallacy, I will live to be 90. Well, that's great, I hope you do. But wouldn't it be great to be prepared now so that if you didn't, your family was blessed? But if you do live to be 90, you're ahead. See, here, here's the crazy thing. We don't want to deal with death because most Christians don't like death. We're enjoying life so much. Can I share this with you? Maybe we're enjoying life a little too much. Paul says, for me to live here on earth is Christ, but man, 
when I die? Is it going to be gain? When was the last time you got excited about heaven and a non-Christian saw it? Point three, sharing. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you shall be witnesses. When was the last time you showed a non-Christian, a non-believer, my hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and his righteousness. And you know, I'm not scared of death because I'm going to be with Christ. When was the last time you were a witness of eternity? Where, where when people are saying, oh, caskets scare me. You say, hogwash. I'm not even going to be in that casket. Oh, my body will be there. But I'm not. I'm going to be with Christ. See, here, here's the craziest thing. When I came back from my holidays, Shelley took the boys and I on this incredible holiday. I shared it with everybody. But see, the funniest thing is I shared it before I left and I shared it when I came back. I was sharing this is where we're going to go, this is what we're going to be doing. Yet we Christians, we walk around like we're not even going to get to heaven. We're just going to die. And yet this is going to be the biggest event in your life. And yet most of us have a negative attitude. It doesn't make sense. If we really believed in eternity and we believed in heaven and we believed in what the Bible teaches, we should be sharing. The fourth one is the peace. I've been there. I'm not condemning any Christian who's going through this. But I meet Christians all the time who do not have a peace about death. They have Christ in their life, Jesus is Lord, but they still, whether you want to call it scared, fear, anxiety about death, it doesn't matter what you call it, they just don't have, they have no peace about death. Philippians 4, 7 says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. What's the key to this scripture? In Christ Jesus. See, Christ is peace. He doesn't give us peace. He is peace. So if I'm having a hard time with death, and I'm just I'm having a hard time with death, I need Christ to touch me. Lord, I not only need you to give me peace, I need you to give me yourself. For when I have you, Jesus, then I have peace, and it will pass all understanding. I remember years ago, a 14-year-old girl, she had a number of sicknesses, and her mom found her. She wasn't breathing. They rushed her to the hospital, and they had her on life support system, 14 years old. And I was called into the, the hospital room, and the father who didn't know Christ, he was pacing. He ran outside every two minutes to have a cigarette and then come back and pace. And the mother was sitting there. She had a smile on her face. How can you have a smile on your face when your 14-year-old daughter is on life support system? And the lady looks at me and she says these words. An hour ago, Jesus touched me. I have peace. Half an hour later, the doctor came in and said, you know, she's gone. We need to turn the machine off and let her heart stop. They came in and they kissed her and the father was just freaking out. And The mother said, Pastor, 
Can you pray that the family has peace? And I prayed. We turned the machine off and the little girl, 14, went to be with the Lord. You know the first song they sang at the funeral for the 14-year-old? This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. And I sat there thinking, she's 14. How can you say this is the day that the Lord hath made? Well, see, this girl had been sick all her life. And God gave the family peace that Jesus wanted her home. See, to a lot of Christians, death is sting. Death is not victory. But when you read the Word of God, our thinking is worldly instead of Christ. In 1888, 1888, there was a man named Alfred Nobel. He's Swedish. He opened up the newspaper and he read an obituary about himself. <laughs> and this is what the obituary said. It said, the king of dynamite has died. This is good. Because this man created dynamite that was used by armies all around the world to kill people. So we're glad to see the king of dynamite die. When he read it, he absolutely freaked out because his brother died the day before, not him. And then all of a sudden, Alfred started to think to himself, is this my legacy? The king of dynamite? And the king of dynamite said, I need to change my legacy. So people are not going to read this the day after. I die. The king of dynamite, this is good. He's dead. So he took the millions he had from mining and chemistry and dynamite sales. And he started an endowment called the Nobel Peace Prize. And his legacy changed. Hey, whether you like it or not, you're going to have a legacy. What will it be? Will your legacy include he was scared of death? He was terrified when the end came? He didn't want to talk about it? Or will your legacy be biblical? Wow. He, he lived for Christ, but he couldn't wait to see Jesus. Now, I want, I, I'm 59. I want to live to be around 80, 90 years of age, give or take. It's not like I want to walk out of here today and die. But there is part of me that's excited. Part of me that's, after, you know, to be with the Lord, to be able to stand in front of Father God and worship Him. I want to see what the cherubims are and the seraphims are. And can't wait to walk on the street of gold and say, man, we bought this on earth for such a high price, and now we're walking on it. I can't wait for the day when he wipes away our tears and our sores. What's your legacy? What's your legacy? I, I, when you came in, everybody was given a fork. Could you raise your forks? Church, raise your forks. Come on, get them up. Now, turn to the person beside you and stab them in the arm with it. Go ahead. <laughs> Tell the person the truth. You'll look good in the casket. <laughs> I told Shelly, 
If she puts a tie on me in the casket, if I wear a tie in the casket, I'm coming back to get her. <laughs> Lady in Wisconsin, she's a farmer. She's a farmer, she's in Wisconsin. She's on her deathbed and she phones the pastor. Pastor comes and she says, I want to tell you how to do my funeral. Pastor says, go ahead. She says, you do the funeral any way you want, but I'm asking for one favor. Pastor says, anything you want, what do you want? And she hands the pastor a fork. When I'm in the casket, put the fork in my hand so people see me with the fork. And the pastor says, well, why would I do that? She says, well, see, I've served people hundreds of meals at my house. I always tell them at the end, I love this, keep your fork, the best is yet to come. She says, I want everybody to see me in the casket with the fork because I want them to know I've gone to the best is yet to come. Can I ask you something? Is death a sting? or a victory? Is death a fear? Or is your faith in Christ? Is death a topic you never want to talk about? We don't approach it. I hate funerals. Or is death something you're looking forward to? I'll be honest with you, I hope I live to be 90, but I can't wait to die. I'm not joking. When I get to heaven, I am going to have such a blast. You know where he says we're going to rule and reign for eternity together? I'm, going to, I'm asking him if he could let me be in charge of a, a water slide. <laughs> I love water slides. I mean, the fact is, I want my water slide bigger than Niagara Falls so that everybody can just... See, here's the craziest thing. Are you pro-death with Christ? Or are you anti? Because you have a worldview. I'm in a taxi in New York City two weeks ago during the American election. And the guy who's driving the car, he's a different religion than me. And I said to him, so are you scared of death? Which is a stupid question to ask a taxi driver in New York City. <laughs> and he said, why, are you going to kill me? <laughs> Immediately SWAT was around the car and I got it, no. I said, no, I'm not. He looked at me, he turned around and looked at me, he says, yes. I said, but you serve your God. Yes, but I don't know what my God will do to me. And I started laughing. I said, I'm not laughing at you. He said, well, what are you laughing at? I said, I'm laughing because I know what my God will do to me. He said, what will your God do to you? I said, I'm going to walk on streets of gold. Your God is nicer than mine. I said, that's because my God is God. I said, my God rose from the dead. What's your God, what's he done? When we finished and I paid him, he pulled over the side road and he said, before you get out, please tell me more about your God. I found out his wife is sick. 
I said, I want to pray for your wife that she will be healed. He says, I don't believe in healing. I said, I don't really care. I said, it has nothing to do with you. I said, it had, God heals. He said to me, I don't believe in your God. I said, I don't really care. I said, I'm going to pray that God shows himself to you. And he looked at me, he says, you know what? I really appreciate you talking to me. Because he says, I've been wondering for the last couple days, where is my God? What's your attitude like when it comes to death? It's not that we should be jumping up and down going, oh, I want to die now. Because they'll lock you up. <laughs> but seriously, are you positive or are you negative? For me to live, man, it's so cool because of Christ. But please don't cry when I'm gone. I've just gone to gain. I've gone to gain. And that's a win-win situation. Thank you.